this is Hong Wei Zhang from Wayne State uh, University. So this is a brief introduction to our uh, cyber physical systems project uh, in the context of uh, vehicular networking and proton control. Uh, this is a joint project led by myself, my colleagues Professor Wang and Professor Ying at Wayne State. And collaborating with SAIC and uh, USDOT in this project in particular uh, we will use the USDOT test bed that's maintained in Michigan for evaluating some of the most of the research results in this project. Along with the fact that um, you know the automobiles have transformed our society in many ways since the uh, first introduction of Ford Motor T in 1908, two specific issues um, are the following. Uh, firstly, our accidents kill over 1.4 million people and injure over 50 million people per year across the world. Uh, in addition, the motor vehicles account for more than 20% of the world's energy use and over 60% of the world's ozone pollution. As you can see, the road transportation has been a major source of uh, concerns in both safety as well as um, uh, environmental um, uh, pollution, which would affect the sustain sustainability of the society uh, as a whole. So, in order to address some of these issues, the you know the research community, academia, industry, and government has been exploring the concept of um, using inter-vehicle communication and control as a basis of. Uh, you know, designing innovative solutions down the road. Uh, for example, <coughs> uh, there has been a lot of effort looking to, uh, you know, what's, what's so-called active safety, which is to prevent uh, act accidents from happening at the very beginning. Uh, that is, if we allow vehicles to talk to each other, allow vehicles and infrastructure to talk to each other, then potentially we can eliminate all the collisions that happen. Uh, on road today. Uh, so, so this has been one domain that's been actively studied and tried out in both Europe, Asia, and uh, uh, North America. For example, in the U.S. alone, uh, there's an um, uh, effort led by the industry consortium such as CAMP, as well as initiatives led by the USDOT. And actually, right now in Ann Arbor, Michigan, there are thousands of vehicles deployed for studying the effectiveness of, uh, um, uh, you know, wireless uh, communication enabled active safety today. So that's about how to leverage wireless networking and control to improve safety. You know, traditionally in the past hundred years, uh, vehicle control has been studied by looking at each vehicle operation individually, actually examining the interaction between the transportation, transportation infrastructure such as traffic light and the vehicle, as well as the interaction uh, between the vehicles and the road, and the interactions between vehicles themselves. So therefore, I think the broad, actually overarching direction is looking to how to control vehicle operation in, the, in this broad ecosystem of uh, environment, traffic infrastructure, and uh, you know, vehicle um, uh, systems as a whole. So there has been a lot of e effort uh, looking to how to optimize the fuel economy and traffic flow uh, in the network settings. Uh, for example, in Europe um, alone, uh, between 2009 and 2011 or 2012, there have been a lot of effort in uh, Sweden and Netherlands that uh, study the relevant um, uh, issues. Um, actually, in our own research group, we have also been looking at uh, network fuel economy and emission control, in addition to this cyber physical system project we are going to um, talk about uh, in more detail. Now, if you look at this pattern change from single vehicle based operation control to network operation control, uh, there's actually a lot of challenges from all uh, aspects of vehicle design and operation. Um, for example, if we even if we just focus on the networking and control aspect, uh, the system actually uh, poses significant cha challenges due to the complex dynamic and uncertain dynamics and uncertainties in the uh, 
system. For example, there are complex physical domain uh, dynamics and uncertainties. But wireless communication itself is subject to the um, right of uh, physical behavior or physical attributes of the environment the system uh, resides in. Um, for example, the actual prov provocation path of wireless transmission itself affect the attenuation of power signal strings, um, uh, so which would introduce complex spatial temporal dynamics in wireless communication itself. Also, unlike uh, the transmission in wired network, uh, wireless transmissions can collide with one another if, uh, if we allow multiple transmissions happen at the same time. Uh, in addition, there's a lot of uncertainties in road and traffic conditions which also pose challenges to uh, the network control, network vehicle control itself. So those are some examples of the dynamics and uncertainties uh, within the physical domain. Now, in s w within the cyber, cyber domain, the network vehicle control and wireless network itself also interact with one another and causes a lot of dynamics and potential uncertainties. For example, the, you know, according to the real-time capacity of wireless networks, which will change uh, depending on the uh, environment conditions, uh, the actual control strategy may vary over time. And then the dynamic control strategy would introduce dynamic network traffic pattern and QoS requirements on wireless communication, which in turn will uh, lead to dynamics in the uh, wireless network itself. So, so, so therefore, you, you see there's uh, actually complex interactions between control and networking that need to be addressed uh, in order to reason about uh, the behavior of the system and then to design solutions for uh, for, s for specific object optimization objectives. You know, despite the amount of effort that has already been um, put into this, the study of uh, network vehicle systems, we are still at a very early stage of uh, research and deployment uh, you know, um, in, in sort of network vehicle control and design. Uh, and then there are actually several fundamental scientific questions we have to answer before we can actually realize the longer term vision and the benefits of network vehicle operation and control. So in this um, CPS project that we are leading, uh, we look at some of the fundamental issues um, in the context of uh, how to address the challenges that the complex cyber-physical uncertainties pose to the design of uh, network control algorithms as well as the design of vehicular wireless networking solutions. In addition, we also look at the interaction between um, the vehicle control, you know, for example, we will study how the topology and real-time real capacity region available from the networking could affect the control design. In the meantime, we will look at how to address the challenges of um, mobility, for example, challenges of mobility on vehicular network design. Um, also, uh, we'll look at also look at how to leverage the information from the control component to improve the network protocol design, for example. If we can get prediction of vehicle mobility, then potentially we can use that in designing better uh, wireless networking protocols. Here's a sort of architecture graph showing, summarize our, our overall thinking about how to address these uh, relevant issues. Now, so uh, hopefully that gives you a um, high level context and uh, ideas about uh, what this project is about. Now let's dive into uh, some, s some specific issues we have addressed. You know, one basic issue that we have looked at is how to enable uh, predictable control of co-channel interference. You know, co-channel interference uh, basically talk about the interference that concurrent transmissions introduce to each other. Uh, it's actually not a new problem at all. Uh, it is actually an open problem since the first time when wireless data networks were used back in 1970s. So over the past decades, there have been a lot of trials um, uh, solutions de uh, deployed, including the solutions used in the Wi-Fi systems today. But a lot of these, uh, the current solutions provide um, 
you know, predictable um, uh, behavior in uh, controlling the cold channel interference, as we have seen our field, st field study as well as uh, analytical study uh, in the past. An interference model, which is the basis of designing any interference control protocols, basically, an uh, interference model uh, enables a node in the network to predict whether a set of concurrent transmissions may interfere with one another. So currently there are two commonly used interference models. One is called protocol model, which is used in the Wi-Fi today. Uh, uh, because of the simplicity of the model as well as the locality of the model. So another model, which is actually more accurate, is called the physical model, uh, which is uh, increasingly being used uh, in the sort of theoretical research right now. But the model itself is not designed uh, for actual uh, deployment in field because of the long local and and global nature of the model. In the sense that, you know, in the physical model, in order to know whether a set of um, transmissions can happen concurrently, we have to examine the situations across the whole network to make that decision, which is usually difficult in dynamic. Um, multi-hop large-scale wireless networks, such as those in the network vehicle uh, settings. So to address this challenge, uh, we have uh, recently proposed the physical ratio K interference model that's specifically designed for enable uh, predictable uh, network behavior um, in dynamic uh, large-scale network settings with uncertainties and dynamics. So, you know, the basic motivation of um, uh, the in, an insight of the physical ratio K model, which we also call the PRK model, is that we can actually integrate the benefits of both the ratio K model and the physical model to provide a model that can, um, can be used in practice to, to enable pre predictable behavior. So more specifically, in the PRK model, Given a sender S and a receiver R, we define an exclusion region around the receiver R, such that any node inside the region shall not transmit while S is transmitting to R, and any node outside the exclusion region can transmit concurrently with the transmission from S to R. Now, the Exclusion region is actually defined based on locally measurable and locally controlled parameters. For example, uh, you know, more specifically, it's defined based on the signal strength from S to R, as well as a parameter that depends on the required link reliability from S to R. Now, notice that you know the signal strength from S to R, as well as the link reliability from S to R, are all locally measurable. In addition, as we'll, we'll discuss uh, shortly, the parameter k um, that you see here in the formula, you know, the parameter k is also locally controllable. So therefore, with this model, we can define purely local interference relations that could be a basis of designing uh, protocols of um, uh, uh, link scheduling for predictable uh, network behavior. For example, uh, predictable link reliability. So if you want to see more de uh, details on the model, uh, you can look at our references here. Uh, if you Google the title, you will be able to find the, uh, the PDF files. So um, before we actually design the protocol, we have studied the potential performance of uh, PRK-based scheduling. And we have found out that despite the locality of the model itself, it can actually increase enable performance that's very close to optimal. Uh, for example, is, uh, you know, if you look at the this region of uh, this figure shows the how much throughput we may lose if we use PRK based scheduling when the requirement of the link reliability uh, varies. As you can see, in you know in mission critical scenarios where the PDR requirement is high, the throughput loss, the capacity loss is actually very low, usually less than 1 or 2 percent. So which basically says you can actually have a protocol that can be uh, executed to give you predictable behavior in practice while maintaining a, 
uh, very good um, capacity uh, region. So, so with that, we can see the potential of PRK-based scheduling. But then there are two major challenges of the in designing the scheduling algorithm for practice. Uh, one challenge is that, th you know, if you recall the discussion earlier, there's a key parameter k that's used to define the, the execution region around each receiver. Now the k depends on many parameters, many factors which may well be unknown at the design time, or even in deployment. For example, it depends on the network traffic pattern as well as the network deployment pattern, node locations, pass loss, exponent, and so on. And many of them is actually unknown, even uh, in at the beginning of the deployment, or sometimes difficult to know um, and varies over time during deployment. So therefore, one question is, how do we instantiate the PLK model on the fly in the presence of uh, dynamics and uncertainties? So that's one challenge. A second challenge is, that once we identify the model for each link, how do we design protocols to enforce the, the enforce the uh, whatever is specified by the model, such that low interfering transmissions will happen concurrently? Now, this issue uh, is challenging because uh, of many reasons. For example, uh, you know, nodes interfering with one another may not be able to hear each other uh, um, with the data transmission power. Also, we know that the wireless transmission and signaling itself could be anisotropic, asymmetric, or probabilistic in nature. Now, we have uh, recently actually uh, solved this to address these two challenges. And we have a report on it, uh, and which you can also Google and find it. So to address the first challenge, we basically model the PLK mod model instantiation problem as a uh, as a minimum variance regulation control problem, where where the reference input is the required link reliability, and the the actual uh, output is the actual link reliability at a certain moment, a certain moment in T. And then the control input is what we call the change in interference at the receiver, which reflects the uh, change in the PLK model parameter k. Of course, when k doesn't need to change, the delta i is equal to zero. And then we model the interference power variation beyond the exclusion region as interference, as disturbance. Now, with this system model, we have designed the controller, uh, which is here, and you can check into the details from our technical report. Uh, so, so with this, we saw the first challenge. And then for the second challenge, um, we proposed to build a local signal map which give information about the power attenuation between nodes close by. Keep in mind that this signal map is a local signal map so that we can actually build the signal map. Uh, you know, the signal map can be built in a distributed uh, efficient fashion. Uh, so we have discussed in detail. Now with the signal map and the interference relation identified by the PLK model parameter K, then nodes can reliably decide whether they can they interfere with one another um, um, efficiently and in a distributed fashion. Now, with this, with this protocol design, we have actually integrated into a running protocol. We have uh, studied the behavior of the protocol in simulation, as well as in several large-scale sensor network testbed, NetEye, Kansai, and NGF. So here are some uh, data about the behavior of the uh, PLK-based scheduling. So this behavior, this figure shows the, the y-axis shows the actual link reliability, and the x-axis shows the application required link reliability. As you can see, the protocol actually ensures the reliability um, that the application requires, and it actually adapts to the uh, uh, requirement of the application. This is achieved by adapting the uh, PRK model parameter itself. As you can see, as the reliability requirement increases, the PRK model parameter increases too, such that the exclusion region uh, increases. Uh, we have also compared the uh, the capacity that's 
achieved in the perks with what are uh, capable, what's possible with the state-of-the-art centralized algorithm. As you can see, despite the distributed nature of perks, uh, the PRK-based scheduling, the, um, it actually achieves a throughput very close to what's possible with a uh, state-of-the-art centralized scheduling algorithm I order today. You know, the uh, PRK model parameter is instantiated by, by running distributed controllers at each node or each vehicle in a network. Uh, so one question is how would they converge over time? So here's the data shows the how much control, how many control steps we need to uh, converge to the desired state. As you can see, the median settling time is actually very small, only eight control steps, and over ninety percent of the links actually converge with within twenty uh, control steps. And then this figure shows the, um, the convergence behavior, or, or the time series of the uh, typical link, time series of the PDR, link reliability of typical link. As you can see, it con once it converges, it stays there uh, over time, stable. That means it has actually converged. Now we have compared uh, the proxy with other protocols. For the same network setting, we have um, uh, looked at the you know the actual protocol that's uh, used today, including the field trials of USDOT. As you can see, for the um, uh, those protocols, they can only give us a very low packet delivery rate, sometimes less than forty percent. Now, for some research, we have also studied some research protocols. For example, the RIDB. Uh, RIDB doesn't uh, that it can actually control considers Inference better than the existing field trials, but it doesn't consider additive interference, so that you know it doesn't really perform much better in practice. Now there are also protocols, CMAC and Screen, that actually consider additive interference, but they haven't done in the right fashion, uh, so that as you can see, the reliability cannot be guaranteed in a predictable in a predictable fashion either. Now, we have l also looked at some of the current practices. For example, in order to get higher reliability, we can retransmit failed packet. But then the drawback of this is that the transmission delay, the delay of delivering packet is increased, as you can see from this figure, especially for RTS, CTS, CSMA, which is used in, practi in practice today. They actually have very large delays compared to uh, our protocol. Or another way of reducing reliability is by reduce the tra traffic load. For example, if we only allow one node to transmit at a time, then um, the reliability will, will be high. But then the drawback of this is that the actual throughput is decreased significantly, as, it, as we can see from this figure. So therefore, it's actually important to ensure predictable link reliability even for the sake of uh, low latency and high throughput, as you can see here. Even though in general, there there's actually trade-off here between these uh, attributes. So that's a quick uh, overview about the PRK model, as well as PRK-based scheduling. Um, so we are very proud of the fact that actually we finally have a protocol that can be used in practice to enable predictable uh, interference control. So we hope we hope this um, we believe this protocol uh, and model will serve a basis for addressing uh, pre co channel inference control problems in many cyber physical system setting in both the vehicle setting as well as other domains such as uh, industrial control so right now uh, the PRK model uh, PRK based scheduling the prox protocol is mostly defined for uh, mostly static networks. We are now extending the results to the uh, mobile network setting where we have to explicitly address the challenges of uh, mobility. In control, for cyber physical vehicle platoon control, we have um, divided the platoon control problem into two sub problems. The first problem is what we call the platoon formation control. Uh, which is to ensure that all the vehicles move in the same lane at the same speed with the desired inter-vehicle distances. So another problem is 
the platoon distribution control, where we need to adjust vehicle spatial distribution such that the road utilization and fuel economy is maximized while the risk of collision is minimized. Now, for the formation control, we have actually made some important progress in this direction by modeling the problem as a network consensus control. We have also defined, uh, you know, in this way we have developed distributed um, control algorithms that ensures that the uh, platoon of vehicles will converge to a state where um, uh, that is that desired, despite uh, challenges such as uh, you know vehicle join the platoon or existing vehicles leaving the platoon, as well as challenges in uncertainties of uh, wireless communication as well as uh, sensing itself. We have proved that the distributed consensus control algorithm actually achieves optimal convergence speed. Uh, we have, through uh, experimental study, we have also shown the benefit of uh, using communication as a basis of uh, control instead of just using the sensor uh, itself. As you can see from here, the convergence speed of uh, communication-based control is much um, faster than the convergence speed of uh, sensor-based uh, uh, control. Now for the platoon distribution control, um, we have proposed to model it as a mean various control problem. Uh, mean various control was uh, originally formulated for financial por portfolio management, uh, where we need to maximize the expected return while controlling the risk at certain level. Now similarly, in the heavy vehicle platoon control, uh, usually the objective is to maximize uh, some uh, metrics such as uh, highway, highway utility or fuel economy while ensuring that we have zero ac accident. So therefore, the problem actually have similar structures as you can see from here. Also, there are many, uh, several advantages of using the mean virus control, control framework. For example, it's actually simple and rigorous at the same time. Uh, it's also computationally efficient. And the form of the solution is readily ac applicable to uh, assessing the risks in proton formation. So far, we have um, uh, studied this problem and has looked at how to reduce the complexity of the problem in large-scale settings. For example, for large-scale di switching diffusion models. Uh, and we'll continue working in uh, this direction. That's a quick summary about this project and you know its overall vision as well as two specific problems in, uh, in networking and control. So before I conclude here, I would like to briefly introduce some other systems effort that that were leading at Wayne State uh, University, which we believe will be of interest to the broad CPS community. Uh, in particular, we have been uh, you know given the complexity of um, cyber physical systems and embedded wireless network in general, we have been building uh, prototype systems as well as uh, experimental infrastructures to enable research and innovation in the network to CPS domain. For example, uh, at Wayne State, we have been we have been running a sensor network testbed, a network sensing testbed NetHigh for almost close to five years. It has supported research in our own group as well as uh, researchers across the world, as you can see from here. So we have also built a control framework by which we can actually integrate the sensor network test bed or wireless network test beds in general as a federated system so that you can leverage the diversity uh, and scale of the different test bed uh, that's available right now. This framework is called Kansai GD, and right now we have uh, Kansai a test bed at Ohio State, NetHigh, as well as some other test bed uh, joining the construction already. So that's about network embedded sensing and control in general. For vehicular uh, sensing and control, we have been also developing a new platform, research platform, which we hope will be, be available to the broad community within a few months or one or a year time frame. This platform will uh, include uh, the open access vehicular sensing platform, which enable us to see 
what's happening inside the controller network of vehicles. That is, get to see the heart of the vehicle operation. That's a sensing part. It also has a software-defined radio, low-cost, high-performance software-defined radio for sensing control systems, so that you know it enables open innovation in this domain. We're also going to um, enable virtualization at the computational sensing and networking um, uh, resources of the platform so that we can deploy these platforms in large-scale real-world um, uh, systems to enable um, uh, research and deployment progress uh, in different communities. For example, both the research and application communities of uh, wireless network sensing control. This is a joint work between our University for and U University of Michigan Debron Tongji University in China. Part of the NSGNI Pro initiative, we have also been running, deployed, and running a WiMAX research network in, De in Detroit, which covers all the highways as well as downtown midtown Detroit and enables, therefore enables uh, vehicular networking and control in this area. So as you may know, it's usually difficult to run large-scale vehicular systems um, in real time and on demand. So therefore, we have been exploring approaches of uh, running high-fidelity emulation um, experiments. For example, we have uh, recently got involved in the NSF Gini RAC initiative, and we're going to deploy a high-end computational server on campus. We'll which will be part of the high-performance cloud computing environment in the Gini, uh, Gini infrastructure. This would enable us to run, run heavy computations in the server, for example, run simulation, large-scale emulation in the server. And with a new project that uh, that's going to start, um, actually in a, in a week, we are actually going to deploy vehicles on campus, which will continue running all the time, tw almost 24 by 7. And then they will be part of the ecosystem of uh, high fidelity emulation for vehicular sensing control. Uh, so as you can see from this figure, it involves our campus as well as the national Gini infrastructure. This initiative will boost the physical deployment of vehicles, sensing control framework, as well as the computational and networking resources in the Gini backbone for executing um, high fidelity Emulation evaluation of uh, vehicular sensing and control networking solutions. So that's a quick overview about the experimental effort happening on our campus. If you uh, want to hear, see more information about our work, uh, you are most welcome to contact us. So as well as visiting our website for more details.